just when you thought we were done with the book of Galatians, we're back at that fruit business again. But this is the last one because we're on the last chapter of Galatians. Now I'm going to give you a little homework and you're going to say, right, right. But I would suggest you go home and read the entire book of Galatians in one sitting. It's only six chapters, but to get the context that we've been talking about all these weeks, and this really sums it up. But before we get to Galatians, I want to talk a little bit about how you get where you're going. <coughs> Anybody take a vacation this summer, a driving vacation? How'd you get there? Did you know the way? So you traveled familiar roads. How else do you get there? If you don't know where you're going, how do you find out how to get there? Road map, said the old man. Jerry Beard told me at the first service you can still get road maps at, at the visitor centers. When you go into a new state, you know, if there's a visitor center, you can stop and get an actual road map. I have not seen a road map in the last 10 years. Any of you ever use a road map? That was GPS when I was a kid. My mother had the map, my father was driving, and there was a lot of yelling going on. Anybody ever try to fold a road map? You cannot fold it the way it was unfolded. I think there's some trick in there that they, they put in. You cannot fold a map the way it was, it was when it started, right? So how many of you have GPS? How many of you use Waze? Some of you are looking like, what? What's Waze? So what does GPS stand for? Very good, Global Positioning System. Um, it's a satellite system, isn't it? That you can, from outer space, someone talks to you and tells you how to drive. Now, I had GPS that was installed in my Honda a couple of cars ago until she tried to kill me the third time. <laughs> I was driving on the Washington Beltway and she said, make a U-turn now, and I thought, my goodness. And she said again, make a U-turn now. She also would turn the radio on and I'd say radio off and she'd say radio on. <laughs> but I was traveling with a friend of mine who when my car told me to make a year turn on the Washington Beltway, 495 rush hour, I said, oh honey, don't listen to her, please. And I said, no, I don't think I will. But um, that's the trouble, isn't it? And what happens if the power goes off or the internet goes down or the satellite gets blown out of the sky or whatever? You wish you had a map, don't you? Maybe to get the old road atlas out, they still make those, don't they, road atlases, but the words change very quickly these days. Well, I think that the scriptures are a road map of sorts for us, and they're always giving us signposts to turn toward God, and we're talking about turning around today, which is the, really the heart of what we read in Luke's Gospel, but let's look first back at the Galatians passage. Here's your Bible test. Where was Galatia in the ancient world? Where is it in the modern day world? Turkey, very good. More than one person answered this week. And the argument is this, the letter was written by which apostle? Paul. And was he in a good mood when he wrote to the people of Galatia? No, not at all. He was telling them that they were in a little bit of hot water with him because why? They were being told that they had to submit to the Jewish law in order to become Christians. These were Gentiles coming to Christ. But he had convinced them that they could just go directly to Christ. And instead, the Jews who believed in Jesus were telling him that they had to go through the law, especially the law of circumcision. I swear it's the last time I'm going to talk about circumcision in a sermon. I'll mention it again for at least six months. I promise you that, because we've had that every Sunday. Circumcision. And Paul said, the only thing that matters is what? Here's your big test. If you've got nothing out of the book of Galatians, get this one line. The only thing that matters is what? Faith working through Bud. The only thing that matters is faith working through love. Because the whole of the law and the prophets can be summed up in one line. You shall what? Love your neighbor as yourself. Some of you have been here the last few weeks. I really believe I saw you here. Go home and read the book again. Read it very thoroughly because this is an important teaching of Jesus Christ coming through the Apostle Paul. Because it's about Jesus, right? It's not about the law. If you have the law and you can fulfill every Thing in the law, you can check every box. Is that what brings you to God? No. Is that what saves you? No. It's the grace of God in Jesus Christ that saves us. So Paul is writing here, and look what he's saying. He's listing off those fruits again as they're lived out in the world. My friends, if anyone is detected in a transgression, you should have received the spirit. 
You who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. There's one. Take care that you yourselves are not tempted. That's that forbearance and patience and all those good things. Bear one another's burdens. It's all about love and peace and all those things that we're called to manifest in our lives. But I picked another passage to go with this one today. This sums up the book. Because for neither circumcision nor uncircumcision is anything, but a new creation is everything. And may I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So then we look at Luke, the parable of the fig tree. Now, I've said before, you cannot take scripture out of the context, right? So this one comes in the time of Jesus being approached by some Pharisees and Sadducees. Now, Pharisees and Sadducees walk up to Jesus with a question, what are they trying to do generally? Trick him, trip him up, make him say something he doesn't mean. They said, Jesus, Jesus, oh, teacher, let us ask you about this, this group of people whose blood was mingled with their sacrifices by Pilate. Pontius Pilate was not a good guy at all. He relished in destroying Jews, and these were Jews who were apparently on their way to the temple to make sacrifice with their, their, their animal sacrifice, and they're killed because Pilate found the Jewish religious practices to be particularly abhorrent and wasted no opportunity to slaughter Jews. And they said, what do you think about that, Jesus? And they wanted to say one of two things. One, to condemn Pilate. And if he condemns Pilate, the governor appointed by Rome, what's he going to be then? What would Jesus be accused of? Sedition. Speaking against the power that rules the land, that occupies the Holy Land. So the Jesus, they want him to say something against Pilate, or they want him to blame the people who were killed that their sin had brought it about. Jesus says, no, 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 no. He's not going to fall for their tricks. What he says to them is, don't think it's their sin that made this happen to them, because you too one day will face the end of your life, so it's an opportunity to repent. Now, I don't think we've changed much in the last 2,000 years because if someone has something happen, there's always some Christian standing by ready to blame them and judge them for their own misfortune. The first funeral I ever preached was when I was 28 years old and I preached it for a 28-year-old man whose wife was pregnant with her first child in her eighth month of pregnancy. He was killed in a motorcycle accident. You don't get a funeral worse than that, let me tell you right now. And because that was when I served the deaf congregation, I was her interpreter. They worked at Fort Meade. They worked for the federal government, mostly because the federal government cannot discriminate against deaf people. A lot of deaf people work for the federal government at Fort Meade or NSA. People came to see her in the funeral home. You know what they said to her? As I said, and interpreted person after person tried to explain why God would take her husband. People said things like, God needed Harry more than you do. God did not need Harry. Harry was a real messed up character in his life. He was. He drank. He used drugs, he sold drugs, he was a mess until the day he found out he was going to be a father and he changed his ways. But still, I don't think God needed Harry. What was God going to say, Harry, should it rain today? God did not need Harry. And there were the people who said, God killed Harry because he was such a terrible sinner. This is how they comfort the wife of a 28-year-old man while she's pregnant with their first and only child. God took Harry because he was such a sinner. And then there were the ones who said, what did you do that God would punish you like this? Now, when you're interpreting, you can't clean up what people say, but as soon as someone would pass, I'd say, you know that's wrong. And she'd say, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. But again and again and again, people did that. And it doesn't just happen on that level. Pat Robertson, when there was the great earthquake in Haiti a few years ago that killed so many people, do you know what he said? He said it was their sin that killed them sin of their ancestors who had sold their souls to the devil years before, and God was wreaking vengeance on them centuries later for what their ancestors had done. That's what he said on the air on his show. You know who else died in that earthquake in Haiti? The head of OMCOR, the United Methodist Committee on Relief, the head of Volunteers and Mission. They were there looking, scouting out places to send mission teams to do work and rebuilding, and they were in a hotel that collapsed. I don't think God acts that way. That's called retributive justice, and we don't believe in that because we believe that Jesus Christ came, took upon himself our sins so that we're not punished for everything we do. And yet that's how we treat each other, isn't it? So Jesus goes on and adds to their next ability to 
trip him up, and he says, what about the people who died in the tower at Siloam? Siloam, the place with that water that they wanted to get to to be healed, the pool of Siloam. Apparently there used to be a tower there. We don't know why it collapsed. We don't know if it collapsed when it was being built or if it just collapsed one day and it killed people. And it was a big news story of the day. Jesus said, do you think that they died because of their sins? No, God didn't do that to them. But use it as an opportunity to repent and believe in God. Now, here's another Bible quiz for you. This one's easy, I promise you. Where's the first time that fig are mentioned in scripture? Think about it. You'll figure it out in a moment. Genesis, somebody said when? Adam and Eve, they realized they're naked. What did they do? They got out the sewing machine and the fig leaves. They made themselves some underwear, right? <coughs> they realized they were naked and they needed to cover themselves, so they stitched together fig leaves. Figs, part of that world for so many centuries now. That was probably northern Africa, that where the garden was, because we know the Tigris and Euphrates, we know where those rivers are, and they're mentioned in Genesis. And throughout the Middle East, figs are ubiquitous. Anybody here have a mimosa tree? Or worse than that, anybody have a neighbor with a mimosa tree? If you have a neighbor with a mimosa tree, you have 38 mimosa trees sprouting in your yard at any given moment. Because they're little, little pink flowers, they flutter down, and the seed gets in the ground and sprouts up very quickly. That's what figs are like, apparently, in that part of the world. The idea of a fig tree not producing is sort of a strange thing that you would cultivate a fig tree. Now, this is a real knee slapper to the people of the day, because Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and Sadducees who would know the law in Leviticus. Leviticus has, now, if you know the story of figs in Leviticus, I will give you my car and you can drive away with it today. <laughs> Nobody knows that one? For the first three years of planting um, any sort of fruit-bearing tree in that world, when they went into the Promised Land and God gave them instructions on how to plant and how to harvest and how to reap and sow and all those things, for three years they were not allowed to take fruit from a tree. The first three years it grew because the tree was considered uncircumcised. I promised last time I'm going to say that word. Uncircumcised. Whoops, did it again. That's after three years then, they could take the fruit, but they couldn't eat the fruit. You know what they did with the fruit the fourth year? They had to take it to give it to God. They took it to the temple. They had cereal offerings and fruit offerings, grain offerings, all those offerings they took. It wasn't just sacrificing animals in those days. You had different, different gifts that you would bring to the temple. The priests would eat the fruit, but that was part of what the temple was there for. They'd eat the animals as well. They didn't just waste these things. They were taken there to give to God, and then they were consumed by the priests on duty. So you got these gifts being offered. So that's four years. And in the fifth year, you were able to eat your fruit. So the fig tree had been barren not just three years, but three years plus four years is seven years. The idea of letting a tree stand there for seven years without producing anything it's a little bit crazy, isn't it? Especially if you're trying to sell the fruit or use the fruit to feed your family or to feed your neighbors or your friends with it. So the idea of cultivating a fig tree would have been funny. They'd have been laughing at that. And then here are the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and Jesus says what? Talking about the vine dresser. What does he offer to do? Let me till the soil around it. Let me give it a little manure. Now, can you imagine being a Pharisee and a Sadducee thinking that this character Jesus is talking about you saying you need a little manure to drop into your life. How about calling the sermon Manure Happens? Ever feel that way in your own life that manure happens sometimes? What are some of the things lately that have happened in our lives that sort of deny the presence of God or challenge our faith? We had this little pandemic thing going on for a while. I don't know if you heard of that. Now monkeypox. Good heavens. Monkeypox. We really needed to hear about that, didn't we? What else are the things that have been bothering us lately? What? The flooding. Especially in Kentucky and places like that, especially places where you have loved ones. Or the trees that are falling in your yards, or the mold that's growing in my bedroom wall because of the water damage in my house. Seems like a lot of things happen, don't they? Those are the things that sort of deny the presence of Christ in our lives and make us want to go to those other things. Here's your last Bible quiz of the day. If the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, generosity, missed one in there, generosity. What were those things that denied 
the presence of the Spirit in our lives. What were the opposites of those things? Debauchery. Greed. Licentiousness. Sorcery. Factions. Dissensions. Sexual immorality. All those things that deny the presence of God in our lives. So what do you do when you're heading in that direction? And I'm not saying everybody's heading in that direction. We have gotten off the path sometimes, haven't we? That's when we're called by Scripture to turn around. It's interesting if you compare this passage, which is about repentance from Luke's Gospel, the parable of the fig tree that did not produce fruit, is a call to repentance. We're all called to turn around, aren't we? Because none of us really always heads in the right direction. We need some course correction. We need a little GPS in our lives, don't we? What if our GPS was God's protection servant, or better yet, God's promised son? comes into our lives to send us in the right direction. I hope we'll all remember that we are called to turn sometimes away from the things of the world to get us into trouble and turn back to God. There are all sorts of things that trap us sometimes, and sometimes the correction feels a little bit like manure happening in our lives, doesn't it? I don't think God necessarily is trying to hurt us, because what does manure do to a plant? Strengthens its roots. Fertilizer is meant to help things to grow stronger and more healthy and to produce better fruit. Now, John the Baptist, when he was baptizing in the wilderness, said, when they came to him, he said, bear fruit worthy of repentance. And he looked at the scribes and the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and he said to them, don't come here to claim that you have Abraham as your ancestor, because already the ax is laid at the root of the tree. Jesus is the one who says, give me some more time. A year is not a good translation. Give me more time is the better translation, and I will, I will do what needs to be done, and then in the future, if it doesn't produce fruit, then tear it down, which means that God is grace and mercy and peace. Listen to a podcast by a Jewish Christian scholar who does a podcast on scripture and the ancient Jewish ties to the faith in Jesus Christ. He says, manure means mercy. This passage, manure means mercy. It's God saying to us, let me give you time, not forever, but I'll give you time to turn again toward me. So I hope that you will go home and read the whole book of Galatians straight through, see it as a whole, and that you'll look at this passage from Luke's gospel as well and understand that God is all merciful, God is all love. The only thing that matters is what? Faith working itself through love. The whole of the law and prophets can be summed up in one sentence. Love your neighbor as what? You love yourself. And then the world's going to change and things are going to grow and we're going to produce fruit so that we will not be stitching those fig leaves together one day trying to cover our sins because Christ has covered our sins once and for all. To the glory of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.